I know we'll have more people joining. Uh, welcome. Um, really pleased to have everybody joining us for this part two of the this SSBCI webinar series, um, focused on this opportunity that really is before us right now, which is the opportunity to, to take the small state small science uh, state small business uh, credit initiative and implement it back out to the states for the second time. Very excited to have this uh, tremendous, illustrious, experienced panel of guests with me here today. Uh, let me do a quick introduction. My name is Victor Huang. I'm the founder and CEO of Right to Start. Uh, we are an advocacy campaign to make entrepreneurship a public priority across all communities. We focus on changing minds, changing policies, and changing communities. Uh, to learn more about Right to Start, you can go to www.righttostart.org. Our co-hosts uh, for this uh, series are uh, the Center for American Entrepreneurship and my dear friend and colleague, John Deary. Uh, Center for American Entrepreneurship is an advocacy group focused on uh, fighting for entrepreneur-centric uh, policies. Uh, they're based in Washington, DC. They've had a big role in uh, SSBCI uh, um, advocacy work, as well as a lot of different issues behind the scenes at the federal level and across the country. So really pleased to be able to do this work with Center for American Entrepreneurship. Uh, as uh, many of you know, if you turned into our first of this series, uh, this opportunity with SSBCI is really a once in a generation moment. This is $10 billion appropriated from the last round of the congressional stimulus uh, focused on expanding capital access for entrepreneurs. Uh, we know that uh, over 83% of entrepreneurs aren't able to access the regular institutional capital markets of venture capital and banking. And this opportunity actually provides a chance for states to be able to build up their capital markets and expand that access uh, in a significant way and probably the most in a generation. So we're really excited about this opportunity uh, to do this. Part one of the webinar was really an introduction to kind of where we are in the landscape, uh, what does it look like right now? And for people that were new to SSBCI, what are some things that you need to know to dig in? Uh, this part two is focused more on implementation specifically with lessons learned. And we've got a tremendous group of people here today who actually were part of a lot of the SSBCI work over the last decade. Uh, and so I'm very pleased to introduce, uh, I will introduce uh, Eric Cromwell, who will then introduce everybody else. Eric Cromwell with Cromwell Schmisser um, was actually the team that was hired by the Treasury Department to assess and review and analyze the last SSBCI program. So Eric and Dan actually know uh, a, a lot of the ins and outs of the program, including what worked, what didn't work, and are able to uh, provide this expertise uh, with us here today. And I'm going to turn it over to Eric right now, and he can tell us all about these other great people he's got with us. All right. Thank, thank you, Victor. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Kick off a presentation. All right, so, so great, uh, great panel um, here with us today. So I could spend a, a lot of time kind of doing the, the deep dive into the backgrounds, but I'd encourage you to, to do the Google search on these people and find out more about them. I'll do the super quick version. So, so Jennifer Teagan is Managing Director of New York Ventures. Um, we first met Jennifer when she was actually with a venture fund that received a capital commitment from their prior SSBCI program. Um, she and her colleague Sharon Rudder um, did a lot of the hard work to set up the last program and now they're thinking about the new strategies. Jennifer is also a member of the board of directors for the National Venture Capital Association. Cliff Kellogg uh, was with us on the last panel discussion last week. Um, Cliff is the executive director of what's called the CPACE Alliance, which is a niche specialty kind of innovative financing tool for property assessed clean energy projects. Um, but more important to this conversation today is he was the former director of SSBCI who was responsible for launching the program. And that takes a special skill set. He's a former, former banker. Um, he's kind of done it all with a, with a public service uh, kind of heart and mindset. So it's great to have Cliff with us again. Michelle O'Connor is an investment manager with the West Virginia Jobs Investment Trust. Um, we got to know Michelle through the first SSBCI uh, go around. And she is also a former banker. Um, ran through their venture capital portfolio in West Virginia um, and is also an entrepreneur. So it's great to have Michelle join us today also. Um, Scott Meacham as president and C T CEO of I2E in Oklahoma. Um, Scott, uh, kind of like Cliff, has uh, accumulated some advanced degrees in, in business and law. He's a former banker and he's kind of done it all in Oklahoma. He's a former state treasurer, a cabinet official, um, and we're pleased to have Scott from I2E. Um, Dan and I kind of go as a pair. Quick, quick disclaimer, um, the views here, we're, we're talking as individuals, not on behalf of the organizations. Um, so whatever we say, kind of put on us as individuals and, and not on the others we represent. 
For those who have not had a chance to look at the reports, I would once again kind of shift your attention over there. Um, they're really good reports. A lot of the information we're going to be touching on today is covered um, there. The official Treasury website is the go-to source of information for the new SSBCI 2.0. Um, for those who really want to dig into the details, read the legislation, both for the Small Business Jobs Act of 2010, which enabled SSBCI, and then, of course, for the American Rescue Plan Act, which then modifies the bill structure. For the program reports, there's the final report, there's the appendices that shows what every state did with the SSBCI funding, and then there is a VC best practices report that all has good information in it. The setup for today. So, as we mentioned last time, the flow of the funding for SSBCI works like this. The Treasury makes that funding allocation down to the state. That's the contract between the Treasury and the state administ administrator. And it's really up to the states to then decide what the program portfolio looks like to support small business. So similar to kind of that second golden rule of those that have the gold rules, right now the attention is on the state governments because they are in the position of authority to decide what types of program models to implement. As we mentioned last week, we do encourage states to consider both a debt and equity program portfolio that is comprehensive in nature. We think the amount of funding justifies that with this reauthorization, but right now the attention is on the states. Our view at Cromwell Schmisher is that if you're going to design a really good venture capital program and implement that well, then you really have to understand the program requirements. And that's what today's conversation is about. So if you're in the audience and you're a small business owner, operator, an entrepreneur, kind of looking about how this could maybe finance your business in time, you're welcome to stick around with us. But most of the comments are really about, you know, how can state officials, how can private investors think about designing the right kind of programs and participating in those programs? So we're going to walk through with the panel really kind of five categories of some challenges of some characteristics um, about SSBCI 1.0. These are things that Cliff at Treasury as the initial director and a lot of the state program managers had to think through and figure out in the very early days. And those early days at times lasted one to two years into the program implementation. The, the really good opportunity you all have and we all have now today is that we don't have to start from zero. We can really learn from that experience in SSBCI 1.0, all the hard work in Treasury how to pick those things up and figure this out much faster to get capital deployed. Because at the end of the day, that is the intent of the legislation. How can the US government, through the states and private investors, get money behind great entrepreneurs? So, so this is, it's private capital leverage requirements. I want to clarify that. It's causation and timing of investments. It's about how states really can attract participation from, from private investors. It's some of the structures about these VC program models and then complex of interest policy. A couple of these we can cover pretty quick, a couple more, a little bit more detailed, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. So first topic, I'll, I'll do kind of the quick setup and then maybe I can ask Scott to, to lead off the conversation for the panelists on this, on this topic. We occasionally get some questions about, okay, when you all say that the program has a one-to-one -one private capital leverage, is that a requirement or is that interpretation? That is a requirement. So, so the program requires, Treasury will require that the overall program portfolio that is implemented by a state agency, the state administrator, must at all times maintain at least one-to-one -one private capital leverage. That is a requirement, is something that a state must not fall below. The 10-to-one is a requirement, but the way the legislation reads is it has to have a reasonable expectation that through the life of the program, those portfolio of initiatives the state administers will then reach 10 to 1 leverage. So those are requirements outlined, it's not an interpretation. And what I would point out while I hand it over to Scott is this, the, the regional and local capital markets operate quite differently. So our encouragement to those designing program is to think long and hard about what type of private investment do you expect to come alongside these dollars? Because that will very much inform what strategy you implement. So with that, Scott, maybe you can kind of kick off the panel discussion with your thoughts on the private capital leverage piece, maybe how you approached this in Oklahoma before and what you're thinking about today. Yeah, thank you, Eric. And, and by the way, I, I agree wholeheartedly with what you said. It's really the one-to-one -one that you really have to focus on. On the 10-to-1, we didn't even get asked in the final report what our leverage was. Um, ours ended up being, I think, 11-to-1 during the program term. But 
if, if you're our, our thesis was if you're investing in high growth startups, you're easily in the long term going to hit should hit in excess of of that type of leverage. But you know we were fortunate because we had an existing program because typical venture funds don't require leverage, right? So if you if you have a private venture fund, that's there's no leverage requirement. But typically state and I guess federal funds do require that. So we were always having to to find that co-investment. The the and there are some things they did that were helpful and there's some things that weren't helpful. So what was helpful, for example, you could count debt financing. Um, and you could you could count, although we don't see a lot of debt and 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 equity in early stage venture, you could do that. And sometimes that was that was the solution we used. You could count angel investments, you could count um, other private ventures, but what you could not count, or you could not count it because it wasn't included in what you could count, was state and local governmental funds. So we were a manager of of state funds, and it would have been a great opportunity to leverage those state funds with the federal dollars, but we weren't really allowed to do that, or it wasn't practical to do that because of the requirement that we had to have the one-to-one -one match at the deal level. So, you know, I think the takeaways are hopefully we get, hopefully Treasury will consider maybe a little kinder, gentler definition of leverage going forward if they can under the statute. I hadn't read the statute, but if they can. Um, but I think a lot of the takeaways you're going to hear from everybody on here is you got to get ready because you got to go fast and you got to have plans in place to capture the leverage, get the capital timely deployed and, and do the things you got to do. Yeah, th th thanks, Scott, for that. I, I think that's a good uh, good distinction for those kind of not familiar with SSBCI. You know, the intent is to stimulate private investment and that term private investment when you're managing some other state resources, you know, can, can get a little bit fluid. So, so maybe there's some flexibility and creativity there. M Michelle, maybe I can ask you to pick up on that from kind of West Virginia's perspective. Again, you're in a market that is going to have fewer private investors than other markets. And then maybe Jennifer, you could follow that because in New York state, you have some regions of the state that has, you know, tremendous opportunity for co-investment and others where it's going to be um, harder to find and, and just different program structures. So, so Michelle, any thoughts on that? Well, in, in West Virginia, you're right. We, we don't have a, a robust um, ecosystem, but the success that came out of SSBCI1 was we elevated the, the, the ecosystem and we were able to attract uh, other investors from out of state. So we have continued those relationships and so we are, are confident that uh, our outreach and our ability to have that history with them and that continued history is going to help us uh, move forward with our program. Um, I mean, I can address kind of what we came, how we came up with that, that ecosystem from the beginning, because in, in the beginning it didn't exist. Um, but we did a lot of reach out and just education. And going back to the, the requirements of the private, um, it was being creative, you know, sitting down and having uh, breaking up the, uh, the deals and the bank takes this section and an angel takes this section and we take that section and the SSBCI funds take that section. And uh, so we had to be very creative because we didn't have a lot of uh, people to, to work with. Okay, Th thanks Michelle. Jennifer, any thoughts on leverage and identifying it? Yeah, so one thing that New York State did um, initially going in was uh, we ended up having a, a match inside of our SSBCI fund um, that ended up being a fund of funds program, but we, um, Goldman Sachs came in with 10 million alongside of us. So right off the bat, we had, you know, a, at least, you know, 30% of the money um, going into any one investment was from private. Um, then we, we set a hard and fast rule with all of our fund managers that, they had to not just have a one-to-one -one match that they had to have $2 of private for every dollar that went in. And some of that came from their own um, alongside funds that um, they were investing um, you know, alongside in these deals with their own money, but then also with other angels and other investors uh, 
uh, in that. So it ended up working out okay in our case, but um, we may also have a slightly more developed ecosystem, even in the kind of maybe not in the Adirondacks in the North Country of New York State, but certainly in the western part of the state of New York and and, and definitely in New York City. All right. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Fund to funds are one way to get the leverage both at the fund level and then through follow on financings at the transaction level. So, so a lot of ways to get leverage there. Um, Cliff, why don't, why don't I kind of move to the next topic? And then if you want to comment on the leverage piece, kind of in context with both of these, that, that would be great. Um, so, so one thing we wanted to point out to, to those who are a little bit unfamiliar with SSBCI is there, there is this legislative language that speaks to in relation to that leverage that the public dollars will cause and result in the private investment. And, and so this in the early days of the program caused a little bit of just kind of angst and, and anxiousness with some program managers to figure out what that, what that meant. So, so Cliff, maybe you can just talk to how you interpreted that when, when you were running the program at Treasury, you know, without trying to predict what's going to happen this time around in Treasury's perspective, but just how you viewed it, what the states did with that, and, and just any, any kind of thoughts you have. Uh, thank you very much, Eric. So the, as you said at the outset, the one-to-one -one requirement is an absolute inflexible must-have requirement. And so the way to satisfy that is to make sure that when the investment closes initially, that there is one dollar, that that one-to-one -one ratio is met. And um, as folks have just said, that could be met either by having other private sources of money that's in the fund itself that, is, that makes the investment into the small business, or it could be from other unrelated funds that are co-investing at the same time as the SSBCI supported investment is going in. So the question you're asking is what funds uh, meet that cause and result test. And in the early, in SSBCI 1.0, uh, we were, we uh, wanted to be accommodating. And so we did not uh, try to enforce a certification or any kind of but for test that would ask other investors to say, gee, we wouldn't have invested if it weren't for the SSBCI investment. We assumed that the other investors uh, invested at the same time as the SSBCI uh, at, on those terms that they offered because the SSBCI money was present. I think where there's some confusion or where there could be uh, ambiguity is whether the money that comes into a company pre-SSBCI can count towards leverage. And in general, I think that is going to be a harder case to make. Perhaps, and I under say, underscore perhaps, uh, if some money closed into the small business in the very recent past at a time when the SSBCI money was legally obligated to go into the small business. I think there may be a case that that pre-SSBCI money was uh, related or the cause and result of the SSBCI money. But generally, it's going to be money that closes after the SSBCI investment is, is into, the, into the firm itself. The, um, so there are four ways to achieve leverage. We talked about the first two already, money that's commingled into the fund itself counts as leverage. Number two, money that closes after the SSBCI or at simultaneous with the SSBCI money, that counts as leverage. Number three would be recycling of money. That would be making and dispersing SSBCI funds, recovering them and reinvesting them into a second transaction. And the fourth way would be by counting subsequent financing that is 
the cause and result of the initial investment. So that would normally mean that the SSBCI money is subordinate to that later money that comes into the business. Right. Okay. Thank you, Cliff. Great comments. And, and if I didn't say this before, um, just to the audience, we, we welcome your questions. If you could put them in the Q&A section of Zoom, it's a little bit easier to manage than the chat function. So feel free to type in and submit some questions to the Q&A feature at any time. But other panelists on this on this topic of kind of cause and result or just kind of measuring or timing, um, anything you saw before or thinking about now? You know, I, I might add one point that, you know, we, we looked at the cause and result and we thought about it a lot. And so, and Cliff, I, you know, I, I think you guys were okay with this because we talked to you about it, but the, we basically said, we took the point of, of a term sheet because we were typically leading the rounds. So once we had a term sheet executed, if the money, if the match money came in before that, we felt it was a cause and result. So, so that helped us sometimes manage the timing because real honestly, we want the checks written before we write our check. So, so we saw that as a, as a good thing from a program manager standpoint. Yeah, uh, I think that's a good, um, I think uh, the, re the reasoning you're talking about makes a lot of good sense to me, Scott. Um, I think that that is the kind of question that you always want to pre-clear with Treasury. Um, I thought what you were going to say, Scott, is we got it exactly right, and you loved our program and loved our rules. But I know that uh, that there's always uh, some twists and turns. So, um, but your rationale sounds consistent with the way I would have looked at the issue back then, and well, let's hope they do it again. It's certainly hard to get it exactly right, um, but, but yeah, Scott, we'll just kind of reinforce that point and talk about the opposite as well. So we did see some states the first go around that would make that initial commitment, hopefully in the form of a term sheet, so something that's more legally binding and serious. And then if that led to private investment, that, that's very legitimate. The opposite of that, though, we did call into question some, and that is if just a very small portion of the overall financing event is SSBCI money and it comes in late, Let's just say it's 10% of the transaction or 5% of the transaction. That's going to be a much more difficult case for a state to argue that there was a cause and result impact of those, of those federal dollars. So we would just you know, encourage states to think seriously about this and make sure you can defend the argument you're making and then communicate clearly with Treasury for guidance. Any other panelists want to, want to jump in on this one? Uh, this is Victor. I had one uh, question, just sort of looking at some of the Q&A coming up from the audience, uh, which is these questions around kind of these amb ambiguous areas, whether SBI or matching money counts, whether new markets tax credits programs count. Uh, what's the best way to try to resolve some of these ambiguities? I guess part of it's just bugging you guys with questions, but, um, uh, but you know, you guys are only so many people. Is there a way to take input and feedback and questions and perhaps try to uh, get feedback from Treasury or to have clarity on these types of questions um, you know, in yeah. the process. Yeah, the challenge with that, Victor, is that um, you know, it's gonna depend on the facts and circumstances of a lot of individual cases and how those deals are structured. So there could be, um, potentially there could be new markets types of funds that in the views of Treasury may have been privatized in a way that um, the private firm now controls them and, and so on, but, but it's a gray area. And so it's, you know, something we would be cautious about giving blank guidance on. Um, Victor, I would suggest if um, that we consider after this uh, webinar, the possibility of uh, folks writing a letter, either a, a sign on letter or individual letters to the treasury with these questions um, and they can be addressed to the treasury department now ahead of the program. And then certainly once the program is going, uh, there should be a relationship manager contact with the state where you could ask these questions for particular circumstances. Yeah, and, and Victor, I think that's exactly right. So, so whereas we all today are just offering our opinions on this and we don't have a relationship formally with treasury, we can't help be a conduit to say there's certain, you know, questions and concerns and just topics that, that we can kind of feed over and, and make sure they're addressed because Treasury is very open to receiving that kind of feedback. We know they're working on this hard. 
they're trying to build out a team to make sure all this gets gets done in a timely manner. So, so if we can be one of those conduits, we're cer cer certainly happy to do that. Okay, let's next topic. So, so marketing the programs, um, kind of mentioned this last time. One interesting thing is, you know, the first go around, no one knew what SSBCI was. Um, now we're all getting a little bit easier at kind of saying uh, SSBCI. And so there is some infrastructure in place. There is some awareness in place. There is some institutional knowledge and memory about the initiative. Um, and now with the additional funding, it's going to be much more aware. But, but these, many of the people here on this, on this panel and then other practitioners around the country really had to do a lot of hard work to try to build that awareness. Here's what we're doing. How do we attract private investment? Just all those kind of things about marketing and making sure the private investors actually participate. So Michelle, maybe I can ask you just from your West Virginia perspective, how did that go for you the first time around? You know, what are you thinking about maybe differently this time with SSBCI's reauthorization about how do you collect the right information? How do you have the right conversations? What can you do proactively to make sure the program gets on the right footing here in 2021 and you don't lose time going into next year? Yeah, um, the first thing that we did with the first round was we hired a, a marketing liaison. So their job was to be the, the conduit from uh, lenders and investors to us and, and make those introductions. Um, and that worked very well. The, you know, the other thing that we did was our program was a statewide initiative, but West Virginia Jobs Investment Trust didn't manage the whole state. What we did is we partnered with seven other um, uh, entities throughout the state so that they could lend within their, with their regions or invest within their regions. And so we did a, a listening tour throughout the state and went to every region that was represented by one of these entities and had, uh, you know, come meet us, let's learn about this. West Virginia has that unique um, spirit where there isn't a lot of programs out there that have money and when you stand up in a room and say, I have money to lend, they, uh, they come show up for meetings. And so there was a lot of uh, information that came from the entrepreneurs. So we had a lot of entrepreneurs uh, reach out to us and say, hey, you know, I have this idea or I have this business. And then uh, we went out and helped source and find and work with other uh, entities to say, hey, we've got this money to come in. Can you, would you be willing to come in with us? And that's how we, we helped with some of that participation. Um, we did a lot of outreach to uh, banks because banks would see, uh, especially community banks, would see more to more venture deals that came across. So we started to educate the bankers to say, hey, if a deal comes across and it's more venture than loan, let us know and you know maybe we can do something with that um and you know just the pure nature of west virginia capital is um not everybody leads a deal not everybody can do an entire deal so rounds uh, traditionally in our um ecosystem are everybody hey i'll put this money in if you put that money in so that that cause and um and re results in that that cause sensation um, conversation was pretty easy for us to, to say because if JIT is coming in with SSBCI dollars, then we'll come in and match with that. And so it, we, we feel very confident about that. Um, what we're looking to do different this time is because of the, the world we live in right now, um, it's probably not going to be an in-person uh, statewide initiative road trip, um, but everybody's used to Zooms. So maybe we start doing the Zooms and bring people in that way. Uh, we feel that that'll be an easier way to get people who have investment capital and angel groups and lenders out uh, to be aware of the program and really understand it. Um, I think it's a lot easier to have that conversation, not only because SSBCI has been around and it's a program that uh, people are aware of, but in the current environment, uh, they understand that there's federal money that's available and you have to use certain entities to access that money. So that's an, an easy conversation to have. And so being able to bring those entities forward and say, here's how you can access the money. Um, that's one of the other you know, things that we're looking at doing different. Yeah. Th th thanks for that, Michelle. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting because when you look back at SSBCI, um, we saw on both the lending and the venture capital side, sometimes the amount of money in play just wasn't enough to interest certain types of lenders and investors. 
But this time around, with every ah. state a minimum of 57 million, uh, th there's a lot of money. And so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. So, so who else wants to jump in on, on this side about how do you attract participation and market the program? Make sure people know what you're doing. Sure, I, I, I have some thoughts there, Eric. Um, you know, it's um, being with the National Venture Capital Association as well as being in New York State. And I just want to, although I'm part of New York State, remember New York, New York City is not the rest of New York State. The rest of New York State is much like any other rural area of, of, of the country, with the exception of a few other cities that we have upstate. So really, it's not that different than the rest of you know, the, the major part the main part of the country. But, um, you know, what we're, what we're doing now is just like talking to our stakeholders, right? Most, a lot of, um, you know, most every state will have some successful startups or some successful entrepreneurs. So, you know, go to them, figure out where their funding sources came from, figure out how they did it, begin to get their feedback as to what makes the most sense as far as a, a program and a structure for a program. A lot of states have venture capital associations. Michigan has one, Florida has one, New York has one just for upstate as well as in New York City. So, you know, tap into those resources or even on the private equity side, again, you'll find, you know, those, those it's a tight knit community of people um, who are angel investors or, um, you know, startup investors, entrepreneurs, and, and usually they know each other and, and they're typically pretty open and vocal about their ideas, right? <laughs> That's the type of people that they are. So, um, you know, I think it's important to get feedback from those stakeholders and make sure as a state entity that you really understand what it is that the entrepreneurs, um, the innovators and in those companies that are, that are out there struggling every day to get that next dollar to grow their business, what is it they need most, right? Um, and, and I'm sure, you know, as, You'll, you know, anybody, you'll be able to get a lot of great ideas. And, and that's kind of the, you know, we're similar to what Michelle was saying, we're, we're on our own sort of listening tour as well. We have a few program ideas in mind right now, and we're testing the waters. We're talking to other states that did something similar. We're talking to some emerging managers to see, you know, what they think about a, a structure around that. So right now we're just in this nice place of, you know, the, the money is, is there. <laughs> we know what our allocation is supposed to be. Um, and now we're kind of scrambling a little bit to just research and homework and, and, and figure out where the need is uh, most for our state. Yep. Scott? Yeah, I might add that, and, and maybe a little different aspect of this. One of the things you have to be aware of going into the program because of the way it was designed is you got very, very little in basically management fees or admin overhead. So I would, I would venture that you could probably not even have ran the program as a startup. And so there's not a lot of money for marketing, which is why we all did road tours and things like that, because you just didn't have that money. And you really have to leverage your existing organizational resources to, to be able to create the deal flow you need to be able to, to, to fill out the program. And, and so just be aware it, it's not for whatever reason, it was designed where there wasn't a lot of, um, of admin and most people like us did it because a, it was a chance to help our state, but B, when you recycled the money, then you, you created some churn that, that you could pay for it over time. Yep. Yeah, and just for the audience's benefit, and then Cliff and Dan, feel free to chime in on this topic if, if you have some comments here. Um, but, but the initiative is structured as a credit support initiative, and so that's really kind of where things like the admin fee structure come in. It just makes it a little bit more difficult to stand up and manage a venture capital program, whether that's done through a VDO or through, through private investors. There's just different complexities and challenges between the credit side and the equity side, more on the equity side. So those are the kind of things that we all face and, and we're trying to highlight. So... Uh, Cliff, Dan, any, anything on the kind of marketing participation you saw last time you want to comment on? Well, the dollars involved here are much larger than they were the first time around. So the your uh, Scott's comment is well taken about the percentage of admin fee being limited to 5% of the first uh, payment and 3% of the second and the third payment. But uh, the fact is that 
the minimum allocation amount this time round is $56 million. So there is, even though the percentages stay the same, we're talking about a whole lot more in dollars than we did the first time round. Yeah, and, and, and uh, you know, the first time around, there was a lot of explaining about what is SSBCI and how does this all work and what are these different programs. Um, this time, most, if not all states have, um, you know, firms that co-invested the last time. And so I would start with them and, uh, and ask them to, um, in your regional networks, to um, maybe join in on webinars about how their experience was, how it works. And, and what we find is that um, that peer-to-peer -peer education is a great way, especially among angel investors, um, to, to really get the word out on the programs. Yeah, thanks, Dan. All right, next topic, a um, little more complex here. So, so this one deals with when you're thinking about supporting private investment managers. So these are organizations, funds that are really independent from any kind of state funding. You know, how do you go about doing that? And so, so what you'll see with SSBCI is there's certain types of terms or conditions that either states or some things that are specific to treasury and SSBCI that just make it a little bit more challenging to do a more traditional capital commitment process of saying, okay, we're gonna be an LP in a fund and we're gonna be just like every other LP and we're gonna commit capital. That's really hard to do here. It's not impossible to do, but it is hard to do. So we just wanted to highlight a little bit of the reasons for that. And then I'll ask Jennifer to kind of talk through what they did with their fund to funds program at New York. And again, maybe what she's thinking about before, but a couple of things about what states do. So, so oftentimes, because this is an economic development program, states will put their own restrictions geographically on where the capital can be invested. And so if you're a private investment fund, you typically aren't investing in a single state. You're regional, if not national, uh, with, with scope. And so that can be real problematic when you, when you try to commingle those funds and you have to go tell your other LPs, well, now this capital looks different than every other capital. So, so those are just hard things to do. Some states attempted to put in what's called a clawback provision. Um, for the most part, we're very much against the introduction of clawbacks. Um, it just starts to um, really get adverse selection on what type of private investors will participate. And so we would encourage you to be very careful with clawback provisions and other restrictions a state puts on that. From the federal perspective, it's what we just talked about with potential caps on admin fees. So the standard 2% a year management fee is very difficult to do, just mathematically. There are investment size limitations. There are business size limitations. Um, there's audit risk, there's things like that, that just lead to most of the initiatives in the original SSPCI when a private investment fund was supported is it would go into a sidecar fund where the only funds there were the SSBCI funds and they were just managed kind of independently, but in sync with the other strategy of the firm. So, so Jennifer, maybe you could just begin by sharing how your program worked maybe some things that you could improve on this time around or just what you're thinking and we could dig into this a little bit deeper. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Um, so New York State for the first go around, I'll just give you some of the, the background. Our, our initial allocation um, for SSBCI 1.0 was 55 million um, and the state decided that 35 of that would be allocated to the venture capital programs. Um, we were able to match that with 10 million from Goldman Sachs uh, and then set up a process because New York State at the time, we do now have a direct fund, a direct equity investment program at the state of New York. It came a couple of years after SSBCI, but at the time we didn't, and there wasn't a lot of time to you know, set that up and get it structured. So we decided to use these funds to um, basically support the private sector um, and, and to set up a competitive RFP process to select fund managers, um, across the state, we tried to make sure that we were not only hitting funds in New York City, which are easy to find, um, but also those in Rochester, Buffalo, Syracuse, et cetera. We selected seven fund managers as part of that program. Um, five of them were outside of New York City, two were inside of New York City. The two in New York City were a little bit more sector or specific to, one was specific to um, uh, diverse teams. Um, ultimately, we invested in 81 companies. Um, we, our private match was nearly 10 to 1 at the last point in time that we measured it. It's well over that now, if you would, you know, kind of keep the clock running. 
Um, and honestly, the, the returns that we've had to date have been excellent and we continue to recycle those monies and um, immediately put them back out or not immediately, but we put them back out to invest in other high growth startups um, in the state of New York along a similar program, but now we're doing it as part of our direct fund program as opposed to in a fund of funds. Um, you know, and as, so the the way that our fund of funds program worked at the state, and and I I, I also want to say like I've only been at New York State for a year, so I'm kind of in this interesting position of um, you know 10 years ago when the first SSBCI came around, I was actually one of the fund managers, so I was a recipient. I'm the fund that I was partner at. Um, we were a recipient of the funds, and so I know it both from the operational side, and now I'm looking at it from the programmatic mm -hmm. side. Um, as, as somebody who gets to set up what the state will do with this new allocation from the American Rescue Act. Um, so we, um, New York State for 1.0, when we selected the fund managers, each, each fund manager had to have a separate fund. There are, the way that the treasury, there, um, you know, being part of a GPLP, you know, there was just no way for us to be able to match easily in, and become an LP in, anybody, in anyone's funds because the, the way that the treasury program was structured, this really didn't allow the flexibility for that in my, in my opinion. And so we went about and set up seven separate funds. Um, so each fund had to man, and, and these funds, the max fund allocation I think was 6 million. So they weren't massive funds, um, but each of the fund managers that we selected um, all had other funds that they were investing alongside of these money. So it was you know, helpful in that regard that the, the match component was there. I will say that some of the pros of doing it that way were that the, um, you know, sitting in the seat of the state, which many of you are, um, is that you know, the state has some, a little more flexibility around um, directing how they want those funds deployed. Like we had to make sure there was a two to one match. We had to, we could only put, um, 500,000 in each initial investment, unless it was life sciences, then it was 750,000. Um, all of it had to be invested in companies in the state of New York. Some of it had to go into low to moderate income communities. So, um, you know, the state had more flexibility doing it that way. On the negative side, it was, um, it was complicated. And it honestly, as a fund manager, you know, having to do a separate audit of a $6 million fund with a tiny little management fee every year is, is painful. And if you know, we're looking at hopefully maybe trying to do an emerging manager fund this time around, because we really wanna see that socially and economically disadvantaged individuals and communities get access to this capital as well, which is a big component of the program. Well, that's kind of hard to do if you're, you know, you're, you're putting a big burden on these smaller managers, smaller funds that are just trying to get up and running because you know automatically out of the box, they have to pay $20,000 for a separate audit for this tiny little fund each year, right? So, um, and also there's separate reporting that goes along with that, you know, you know, more um, administrative, even at the state level, we had a lot more legal expense. We had to hire an individual person who managed that fund to fund programs and all the tracking and reporting. We had to hire somebody externally to, to help us to manage the flow of funds even. So, um, you know, the, that's definitely the downside of, of doing it that way, but I don't know, um, you know, it's not sounding like from Cliff that will next necessarily have that influence at Treasury. I'm hoping we might, um, because I do think from an emerging manager perspective and getting the funds into, you know, fund managers and being able to have a more straightforward structure that's easier to manage probably ultimately better for the states, ultimately better for the fund managers if, if we could um, have the flexibility to become an LP inside of an existing fund structure instead of um, doing it the way that we did it. But I'm not complaining. It was a very successful run for New York State, and it has spun out so many benefits, um, including to me personally, because now I get to uh, be managing director of the program at, at the state of New York. So uh, anyway, uh, I, I'm, and also please, if anybody has questions, um, feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, kind of on our experience and how we went about it too. Yeah, well, well th thanks for that. Um, New York did implement the largest fund of funds. There were several states that, that managed a fund of funds program, S similar in nature, sidecar funds mostly, not, not always, but mostly. Um, and this time around with the additional funding, we do think states 
can and should be thinking about how to build long-term investment capacity, meaning new funds and more locations. Because at the end of the day, that's what we need. We need, we need really good VDOs doing the heavy lifting at early stage investing and venture support. And we also need more private investment funds and more markets. And a fund of funds can accomplish that. Um, Victor, did you want to jump in with a, with a question then we'll quickly cover the last topic? Yeah, um, along the lines of what Jennifer was talking around, around uh, the burden on emerging managers and trying to reach emerging managers and what you were saying, Eric, around funds of funds, you know, capital that actually helps spur more fund development. Um, we had a question from the audience from Kelly Northridge who asked this um, issue around the current you know, venture capital system, as, as we all know, is kind of the status quo is geared towards um, you know, sort of a, a, a type of people that maybe aren't reflective of the diversity of uh, the broader population, specifically leaving out a lot of women fund managers, a lot of minority fund managers, which means that the entrepreneurs they fund tend also to be biased against those categories. Um, uh, there was talk earlier around engaging the local stakeholders in, in the community. Can, you, can all of you share a little bit about your lessons in terms of how you engage the stakeholders and design programs in ways that actually are able to reach uh, emerging fund managers, fund managers that perhaps have never been able to participate in these types of things and design programs that are supportive of, of, of those types of emerging fund managers? Yeah, that's a good question. Jennifer, you want to start off on that or shall yeah, we? Yeah, I, I, I can try. So, um, you know, I, I, again, um, in, uh, you know, speaking from the, 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 the filter of my own state, um, you know, we, we definitely, uh, you know, I, I know there are some associations around where that track emerging fund managers. Um, and so I think that that's um, certainly an angle that we're going to take as far as, you know, trying to identify who some of the more promising ones might be, who's struggling, um, or, you know, to, to get to that threshold of, of their first fund. Um, to see if we can, you know, what we might be able to do there if we're successful at being able to set it up. Um, but I think, you know, again, it's just tapping into that, that ecosystem, letting people know that you're out there, contacting the, the, the entrepreneurs that have been successful in your state, especially if they're diverse, um, you know, founders reaching out to those associations. But it's true, you know, venture capital is, uh, it's, it's getting better. You know, if you look at the recent report that NVCA did with um, Deloitte, um, you know, the, the numbers are, are trending in the right direction, but they're still not where they need to be. And, and certainly a big part of the federal program is to, to make that, to make improvements with that. So um, I don't know how you kind of necessarily find somebody who's never managed or run a fund to, you know, and pull them in. But, you know, part of um, what we do regularly and consistently and, and at New York Ventures, even with our direct investment fund is that we, we have a, we don't have a hard requirement on a diverse team um, or, you know, working with diverse, uh, you know, diverse founding teams, but it's, it's a pretty, like, it's a pretty strong filter internally on our team that um, everybody is tested by, by that first, you know, by, by that. And I think the more that you put it out there that you care that as a state, you care about these issues, that it's important that you um, you know, the diverse team. So, so maybe not everybody on, on the team that has a diverse background, but at least there's, there's a woman or there's a minority or that they're, they're structuring their founding teams as an emerging manager or as an investment team. Um, to, and they're, they're putting that filter on it and they know that you care about it. I think that does help and it does make a difference. From the West Virginia perspective, we didn't uh, do a fund of funds model, um, but we engaged uh, local um, sources. And what we found as we started to map out the transactions that came through the program was they were not really centered in the high population areas of our state. So the I-79 corridor through Charleston over to Huntington, those didn't necessarily where the, where the deals were coming from. What we found was because of reaching out and talking to the local uh, revolving loan funds, EDAs, um, reaching out to local and centralized uh, angel groups and all of that, they had the diversity already in their area and had a mission. And we talked to people who specifically had missions to meet those requirements, small businesses, minorities, women, and 
every time we did a, a, a quarterly report to the treasury, we, we sat there and looked at how were we uh, measuring compared to what we said we were going to do. And we, we made a conscious effort of doing that. Going forward, one of our outreaches is going to be, uh, we have a, a women's business center now that's a statewide initiative. And so they're going to be brought into the ecosystem and be part of sourcing deals and talking about the program and that outreach, uh, partnering with the SBDC um, and helping them understand, you know, for the micro businesses and people coming out of the pandemic and having business ideas and um, being able to help those and, and be more diversified. So we are approaching our last program with the best practices that we learned off of that for the new one with the fact that um, areas that of the state that were heavily populated that had capital for deals that um, really didn't meet the mission and spirit of SSBCI were already being funded. What um, was actually funded were those smaller entities, those smaller organizations and startups that were outside of the ecosystem at that time. But now because of SSBCI, we were able to elevate that, that ecosystem and we're just gonna continue to move forward with that. Yeah, I think those, those, are, those are really good, good points. Um, I, I think what, what we would say at Cromwell Schmisher is um, both need to be considered intentionally on the outside of SSBCI planning. So, so, so we've got this you know, kind of next phase of the economically and socially disadvantaged individual segment. We don't exactly know what that's going to look like. But even on this formulaic funding, we would encourage states to think about the diversity lens. Now, the challenge for a lot of states, because of the extreme geographic concentration of EC, is they really need to address these two fundamental problems. One is many states just have a scarcity of VC in general, diverse or not, it, they just don't have it. And, and so one is, how do you try to provide more capital into the marketplace, no matter what the entrepreneur looks like? But then also there are specific needs and opportunities, especially with SSBCI to try to anchor new programs and new funds that specifically address that. So, so what a great opportunity. All right, I know we had an ambitious uh, agenda. Um, I'm just gonna quickly talk about conflicts and then, and then we'll turn it back over to Victor to wrap us up and, uh, and see if there's any final questions. We're happy to, to follow up with questions offline later if there's any, anything you all would like to discuss with us or any of the panelists. But the conflicts are something that, that was worked through in detail in SSBCI because for the first couple of years of the program, the venture capital initiatives were all governed by banking regulations, which did not work at all. And so the treasury then set out to create a conflicts of interest policy. You're never gonna make everybody happy with a policy like this. And so I'm not saying it's perfect, but it was a good framework to make sure that a few things were being done. And the most critical parts of the conflicts of interest policy that treasury put in place are one, know what an SSBCI insider is. And so there's different documents and publications you can find that Treasury put out that'll say, well, here's what we consider an SSBCI insider. And basically it's those who have the authority to make program design and program funding allocation decisions. And if you are an SSBCI insider, then in no way can SSBCI funding go towards an investee where you have a financial interest. And so being able to identify and know what that definition is in your program is really, really important. The next thing is to make sure that you're covering that all the way through the, the, the financing life cycle. So actually looking at cap tables to say, are we really cross-referencing to make sure that there are no SSBCI insiders that have a conflict? Document that, document that, document that. Um, so we, we were gonna dig in a little bit deeper to this topic. I know it's one that people have a lot of opinions about. Some think it's fantastic, others would like to see it changed, but it's a good framework. And, and it was really put in place, the last thing I would say is to help the VC program managers, because before this initiative was put in, before the policy was put in place, really follow on investments were prohibited because of the banking regulations. So, so it got a lot better with this policy. We'd be open to ways to improve the policy, but I'll, I'll kind of stop there on that topic and turn it back over to Victor for um, maybe a wrap up with the panelists and, and any maybe questions that are burning. Oh, uh, that's great. Um, I think uh, so much great information here. I guess, uh, Eric, are there any key topics that we didn't address just to kind of let people know that there's topic areas you think are worth going into that perhaps they could follow up with you or any of the panelists on here? 
To, to, to me, Victor, th these are the five that we hear most about. I think these are the ones that really either kind of slowed down capital deployment or just took, took time to figure out. So, so for those new or even rethinking these things again, I really would start with these five topics, but I would open up to the panel to say, you know, did we, did we miss something here? Are there other things that, that you would flag for the audience to say, okay, really spend time on this or think through this because it either caused you problems before or maybe just missed opportunities? Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's fantastic. Um, so I've got a lot of questions around, is this information going to be shared out? There are links for the, uh, the resources that uh, uh, Eric talked about earlier that uh, uh, have uh, links here in the, uh, in the chat boxes. Uh, people also asked about the video getting shared. Yes, that will be shared, both this one and the prior one. The video links are going to be shared out as well. Um, and then um, as uh, uh, Cliff and Eric uh, and Dan talked about, if there's feedback or questions uh, all this is going to be useful for getting it to Treasury, either reaching out to D Treasury directly, or uh, if it helps, uh, you know, we we may start to aggregate this information and put it into a combined letter for Treasury as well. So Treasury has it all in one place. Um, so these are all extremely valuable um, uh, source of information. Uh, Jennifer, Michelle, Scott, Dan, Cliff, Eric. Uh, it's it's like an all star cast of uh, the SSBCI stars from. From the past and and ready for round two and so we're really excited for uh, uh, bringing the band back together and and helping people do this bigger and better than before um, i love some of the themes around um inclusivity bringing people to to the new 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 voices at the table uh recognizing emerging fund managers and recognizing that uh there are also geography and rural versus urban are all big issues around underrepresentation that we're all trying to address in different ways and every state is a bit different um, so uh, I want to thank everybody again for participating in this. Thank you all for uh, on the audience for joining and listening and asking great questions and uh, look forward to making this a great successful SSBCI round two. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.